now it's now it's really official. Um, welcome to Wheel of the Year Fall Equinox, a six week guide to Mabin, Second Harvest, which is Thanksgiving. This holiday has a lot of different names, which I think uh, reflects the variety of work that we can approach at this time of year. Um, Thank you for joining me. My name is Megan Angus, um, and I've been doing this for far too long. <laughs> and, you know, miles to go before I sleep, apparently, according to the gods. <laughs> um, tonight, we are going to talk about fall equinox from a bunch of different directions. And uh, my job, I feel like, in these lectures is to give you folks who are practicing pagans, heathens, witches, magical workers, slash folks who are curious, folks who are coming to this uh, amalgam of belief systems, folks who are returning to this, um, exploring it, whatever, a, a, a bedrock of science, myth, archetypal imagery, folklore, um, as well as some religion and some tarot and some magical stuff to, stuff to work with. Um, I am a huge believer that our ancient ancestors were incredible scientists and incredible storytellers, as well as spiritual beings and just normal ass folks trying to make their way through the world. Um, you know how it is, traffic, mastodons, you know, throws off the whole day. Um, and so I feel that not appreciating uh, our past from a, a scientific perspective as well as folkloric and spiritual, et cetera, et cetera. We're, we're missing a big chunk of the, the story here. Um, so that's always included in, in the stuff that I'm talking about in the Wheel of the Year. Um, I have new folks in this class, and I'm really excited about that because I've been teaching to a bunch of you old farts for a long time. So it's nice to have some new blood in here. Um, and the so I'm, a little preamble before we really get into the stuff. Um, the wheel of the year is a modern pagan concept based in old practices. And yay, thank you. Yay, good. I'm glad you're here. Um, and I think it's really important for us as modern pagans, witches, heathens, magic workers, whatever you call yourself, um, to recognize that this thing that we are talking about in the modern sense is a modern concept. And yes, it is based in some old practices, but a lot of what we're doing is a hodgepodge and a collection of traditions that have been brought together. In my research, and I'm gonna say that a lot because I don't know everything, no one knows all of it, right? And we're learning new things every day um, and we're rectifying old things every day too. Um, in my research, there is no group of people that we would think of when we say the word pagan, um, ancient, modern, ancient, or really ancient, who practiced all eight of these holidays. So right there, we know that something about what we're doing here is, is a collection. It's, it's an amalgamation. It's a hodgepodge. It's a patchwork quilt of traditions. Um, we have a lot of traditions or a lot of cultures in the past that celebrated two main holidays or sabbats is what we would think of them as. We have some that only did three. We had some that did four. We had some that did six. I have not found a, an ancient culture that did all eight. Modern witches um, are taught the wheel as eight portions. Um, and it makes sense. It's certainly a cool practice. Uh, there is a rhythm and a pattern here that we can work with and all of that is really cool. Um, but I say all of this as a, a reminder and um, a place where you can kind of let go of having a tight grip on what we might think of as tradition or the past or history. Um, that is, those are very fluid concepts when we take enough steps back and look at the larger picture of human evolution and human spiritual practices. Um, and so, uh, you know, throughout time, um, as I really should say throughout the last hundred ish years, pagans have gotten real uptight about certain things being true or certain things not being true. Um, and I just encourage you to check another reference. Don't just listen to me as some lady on the internet yelling about things, um, read multiple books, check multiple websites, 
um, you know, look at what the Encyclopedia Britannica has to say and the Wikipedia page and compare and contrast. Um, no one is going to have all of the answers. And as science evolves, as archaeology evolves, um, as our understanding of what people were doing in the past evolves and we stop projecting meaning onto it um, and we start allowing the history and the past to just speak and reveal itself, so too should our understanding of all of that stuff evolve and change um, you know, what I taught at parties at my house 20 years ago, very different from what I started to teach in 2015 when I started to do these classes in a more formal setting. And there are absolutely things that I put in my workbooks in 2015 that I have taken out since, or I have completely changed the wording around that because I have continued to learn and change uh, my understanding of that stuff. So not to go too far afield in all of that lecturing moment, but just to say that this, I think, is an evolving concept for us modern pagans, and that's really cool. Um, that means that this is a living entity that we are working with because it is growing and evolving, and parts of it are dying off or changing shape, just like all the other organic stuff that we work with in the world. Um, and I think that that's really exciting. Um, that means that we have uncharted territory to explore. We have stories that haven't been told yet um, or can be retold in various forms over and over again. And we have these really incredible concepts and archetypes that we can approach with new attitudes or shifting attitudes as we move through our life and as things are revealed um, through the various sciences and, and exploits of human endeavor. So. I think it's cool. Um, and that's that's that. OK, secondly, um, I uh, did come up in the 80s and 90s because I am a Methuselah. So uh, I do occasionally use antiquated language. I am trying to evolve my language. Sometimes I slip. So apologies in advance. Um, but when I am talking about goddesses, for example, I will often refer to them as she, her, but these are genderless beings. They often embody uh, activities that particular humans may engage in, but we know that something like birth, for example, is any gender can give birth. So, um, you know, traditionally speaking, when we look back in the past, a lot of the goddesses whose histories have been recorded or retained um, have a very feminine look and they are attributed these particular activities, but we know that in the course of human events, um, all of us have capacity to do these things. And so when I'm talking about a goddess who gives birth, for example, what I'm really talking about is that thing that is within all humans that has the capacity to gestate something, to produce something, to foster and nurture something. Um, all humans have the, the capacity and the skills to do that stuff. And same when I'm talking about gods, oftentimes gods are depicted very specifically with penises and they're depicted in ways that we would traditionally describe as masculine. But the stuff that gods do are things that all humans have access to. And when I'm talking about gods, I'm talking about those parts of us that thrust, that push, that are extroverted, that are going out into the world and getting the thing that we want. And even within that, we have goddesses that fit that description. I think of a goddess like Brigid, uh, who we talk about at Imbolc, who is very feisty and spicy, and she is very willful and absolutely out there telling people what to do, an amazing leader, making shit happen. Um, and we absolutely have gods who nurture and who gestate and who, uh, you know, carry uh, humanity through pro different experiences and processes. So this stuff, just like the history itself, is really fluid. And I feel like the more broad and open-handed we can be with our understanding of these concepts, the more accepting and just witnessing of them that we can be, the more we are going to get out of our interactions with these ideas and these archetypes, these deities, all of that stuff. Um, I even think that at times um, that can help us relate to our ancestors um, in more intimate ways because they know that they can express themselves in their full capacity and that they don't have to, um, you know, sort of, I guess, fit themselves into some sort of modern mold when it comes to gender roles or any of that type of stuff. So 
Um, last but not least, um, I am teaching this here for now anyways, in Seattle, Washington. This is unceded Duwamish ancestral territory. Um, there is an incredible uh, change.org peti petition to get the federal government to recognize the Duwamish as a tribe. Seattle, one of the richest uh, cities in the country, um, the Duwamish somehow can't get recognized as uh, as a federal or by the federal government um, as a real tribe, even though <laughs> Chief Self literally gave us thank you, Kirsten, um, uh, gave us the name of our city, but somehow he's not real. Okay, sure. Um, this is a place where you can go to uh, sign a petition to tell the government, get your shit together, please and thank you, on one of many things, right? Um, and also there is a group that I used to talk about a lot um, and I haven't brought them up in a while, but they are called Real Rent Duwamish. And it is a place where you can either give a one-time donation or pay rent monthly to the Duwamish tribe. Um, they're doing really fantastic, which is why I've started to talk about other um, nonprofits and other support groups, but they certainly still need and deserve support. Um, so there's that. And if you were watching this somewhere outside of the Puget Sound area, check out uh, the indigenous tribe that your city was named after. It probably was. <laughs> um, or the, uh, you know, if it was named after a saint, if you live in a sand somewhere, right? Uh, that saint is probably based on an indigenous ancestor or an indigenous deity that was worshiped in that area before the Catholics came through and supplanted it with a saint, which is something we talk about quite frequently here in the classes and on the podcast. <laughs> um, and you know, learn that history and find out who that group is and give them your support. Um, the support that you can give to your local groups is always gonna be the most potent, generally speaking. Um, all right, I think, that's, I think that's all the stuff. Feels like a good run through, it's 20 minutes, good enough. All right, let's go into it. Okay, boom, Maybon. What are we talking about? Well, first and foremost, uh let's get into our witches work so let me do this and do that and thank you ryan these are designed by ryan allred if you need some illustrations check that person out he is rad there we go all right our witches work for maybon we are still in the harvest um this is technically second harvest lunasad or lunasa or lamas uh, is first harvest or the grain harvest. This is second harvest or the fruit and veg harvest. Um, and so harvesting, uh, we are really in the thick of it now at this point in the, in the wheel. Um, but other things that we are focusing on at this time, health, purification, balance, and transition. And as usual, we're going to get into all of this stuff. Um, Yeah, okay, right in this order, why not? So health, health becomes a, a focus for our witches work at this time of year because we are in a transition period. Uh, we are leaving the, the heat and the glory <laughs> and the intensity of summer. And we are moving through this transitional season of fall, or we are about to begin to move through this transitional season of fall. The um, days grow shorter, the nights grow longer, the temperatures begin to cool for us here in the Northern Hemisphere. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you are experiencing the opposite of it because it is the spring equinox. Um, and, uh, and, you know, our, our plant world begins to slow down and ultimately stop and go into hibernation animals and insects tend to kind of ramp down their energy and either migrate or they also go into hibernation. And the natural world begins to kind of button itself up and go to bed, um, or at least begin to slow down its production. We're at the very height of production and then it's just gonna be sort of downhill from here going forward. Um, and we want to be taking care of our health in that process. So health and minding the body, minding the emotions, minding our psychological health during the season is really important as we transition, again, from the heat and the intensity of summer uh, into ultimately the chill and the stillness of winter. Um, and so within that purification, and I think that we start our purification practices um, really during Virgo season. And for me, even though technically 
uh, astrologically and all of that stuff, Virgo season ends at fall equinox. For me personally, Virgo season is sort of the the basket that fall equinox is carried in, even though uh, the season of fall equinox, if you will, or Mabin or second harvest or fruit harvest, even though this season is under the auspices of the sign of Libra in tropical astrology, um, I really feel like Virgo is sort of the 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 doula of fall, um, and sort of oversees the production and the arrival of fall. So, uh, a lot of our purification stuff starts in um, in Virgo season, and thinking out, uh, well, first off, thinking within our lives, that purification can just look like again, kind of cleaning out the excess of summer and making room for whatever this transition season is asking of us. Um, but also if we're thinking out into the world and we're thinking about these harvests, the last of the grains are being pulled in and then we're doing this fruit and veg harvest. And then we are going to be purifying the fields. In other words, shutting them down for winter. We're gonna be clearing out all of the rest of the vegetation um, that either has stopped producing or isn't going to produce. And we're sort of clearing, we're just clearing all of that stuff away um, and making room for winter to be able to do its thing. And then ultimately we will be in spring and we will start the cycle all over again. And so within all of that stuff, balance and transition. Um, transition, we've already mentioned a little bit, but balance, absolutely. Here at fall equinox, we'll get into the science of this in just a second. Um, at fall equinox, we are seeing a literal balance of night and day. And, um, and within that, um, what is happening for us is uh, in the Northern hemisphere, daytime and nighttime literally come down to having the same amount of actual minutes and seconds. <laughs> uh, and then there is this tip into the darkness. Bwah -ha, ha 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 Finally, spooky season is officially here. Um, but as a magical moment, this is incredibly potent because uh, we get a literal astronomical event that gives us an opportunity as magic workers, again, whatever you call yourself, um, to stand with a foot in the light and a foot in the darkness, a foot in the known, a foot in the unknown, a foot in the conscious realms, a foot in the unconscious realms, a foot in the worlds of the living and a foot in the worlds of the dead or the beyond. Uh, and that is a really potent space to be in. Liminal spaces like that are hard to find and they often are really fleeting. Um, and so before we get into everything else, um, <laughs> tangent, uh, there's a gigantic piece on my Patreon about timing when it comes to observances, ritual observances, holiday, Sabbath observances, whatever it is. And depending on what it is that you're doing, sometimes it doesn't matter when you do it. You can totally do it whenever you want to. And then other times it really matters when you're doing it. So, for example, if you were wanting to hold a ritual to observe the literal balancing of light and dark, you would want to look up on, you know, uh, JPL's website or NASA's website or uh, weather.com or whatever. When is the exact moment of the equinox for wherever it is that you live on the globe and you would want to center your ritual right around that time because that is the literal time uh, for me the equinoxes and the solstices or solstice equini and solstice um, uh, though they are referred to as the lesser sabbats um, they are more precise and so they are, again, these really incredible moments where we can experience this liminal space in our physical world, in real space time. Um, that's potent stuff. Um, it definitely uh, affected our ancestors. They were a little freaked out about it and in good ways. Um, but you don't have to, and it's not required to do that. And if you're like, that's cool, and I'll think about it on the day of, but I don't have the, you know, Thursday at two in the afternoon off from work. I can't do it right at that moment. Um, 
I'm going to observe it on the weekend. Cool. Right. It really has more to do with what it is that you're trying to do. Ultimately, are you trying to enjoy the moment and celebrate with friends and family? Do it whenever is convenient for you. Are you literally doing a ritual or a spell or a, or a work of magic that incorporates the actual moment of balance? Then yeah, we want to be as precise scientifically as we can. So that's up for you to decide as to like, what is the most important thing there? Other ways that we are uh, moving through this work at this time of year, we are giving thanks. Uh, the bounty has been rolling in and the bounty is continuing to roll in and will continue to roll in through third harvest or Samhain, otherwise known as Halloween, otherwise known as the blood harvest. <laughs> okay, sorry. We'll, we'll get real spooky when we get closer to that. Um, and so in that, sharing your bounty. Sharing your bounty is an incredible way of giving thanks for everything that reality has provided for you and what you have done with your own work. It's a way of saying thank you to yourself that you are able to share with your friends and family and community. Um, look at the work I did, this is rad. Now I get to spread it around and make somebody's day. Freaking great. Um, and then ultimately rest after labor. If we are um, thinking of this within the metaphor of uh, the goddess, um, a version of the goddess referred to as the mother is here at this time of year and literally giving birth to this massive harvest that is happening across the Northern Hemisphere. And so as that concludes, we then go into a reclining position and a chill zone position <laughs> overseen by Libra season um, where we relax, we have a beverage, we enjoy the couch, we put our feet up and, we're, and we take a big sigh and kind of whoo before we continue on with the transitional work that we need to do and ultimately get ready for winter time. Um, communing with ancestors, purification already said in healing, that is sitting with our, um, uh, as we are shifting through the season and moving within that metaphor of giving birth and then time alone. Um, communing with ancestors and divination, really I should have on this list, I don't know why I don't. Um, communing with ancestors and divination, real big freaking deal at this time of year. Why? Again, because one, we are in this liminal space where we have relatively easy access to the other side that we don't normally have access to, or we could also say that we haven't had access to for the last six months. Um, and so that in and of itself is a really cool opportunity to do divinatory magic and kind of part the veil and look over on the other side, whatever all that stuff means for you. But also because um, there is a lot of uncertainty uh, for the human organism uh, as we move through fall and into ultimately winter. Uh, for folks who live in the Northern Hemisphere, traditionally speaking, winter time is the scariest time. It's the hardest time to be alive on earth. It's cold, nothing is growing, the animals have either disappeared or they're hibernating or they're just like, we're not doing anything, you can't get anything out of us. Um, and we can't just continually go back into the fields and go back into the orchards and go get more of whatever it is that we've been growing. Those systems have completely shut down. And Mother Earth has been like, I'm out fishing. I'm gone to lunch. Goodbye. <laughs> like, no, I'll see you in February or March or April, depending on where we are, uh, you know, in how high up on the globe we are in the Northern Hemisphere. And so it might be a long ass time before we get to tap into those systems again and get support from the natural world. So divination practices were incredibly important for our ancestors at this time of year um, as a means of asking, did we do enough? Is there still something else we need to do to secure our safety and our bounty and our survival through winter? Is there anything that we can do to propitiate those forces of chaos that are on the horizon and, and approaching us? Um, you know, what can we do? And in particular, a, 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 in particular, as a means of divination, communing with ancestors. And in that, asking the older generations and those who have passed, how did you guys do this? How did you all 
managed to make your way through this unknown, the uncharted territories, the chaos that is in front of us? What were the mistakes that you made? What were the things that you did that you didn't think would work, but totally did? Uh, please share those secrets with us. And it's my opinion, and I mean, I'm sure it's not only my opinion, I probably read this somewhere, but it's my opinion that a lot of the magical traditions that we see in our Sabbath practices are actually these teachings. Um, I don't even know why I'm saying this is my opinion because I'm literally going to teach that that's what's happening later in the class. <laughs> I've done this before. I'm a professional. Okay, stop. Um, but uh, I, you know, I think and I know that a lot of those ancient practices that we kind of just look at as like, oh, okay, I'm supposed to put the cup here and we have this thing on the altar and I have my corn dolly and stuff. These were actually elements of teaching the younger generations. This is how you do this. And this is how you stay alive year after year. This is what you need to do to keep your animals safe, to keep your people safe, to keep your stores safe, um, all of that stuff. Okay, so other names for this holiday. Um, which is Thanksgiving, pretty straightforward, right? We've got bounty on bounty on bounty of food happening at this time of year, which is Thanksgiving. Uh, traditionally, the time pagan cultures would have celebrated the abundance of earth after the massive crop harvests have ended, but before the weather gets too cold to party. Um, also fruit harvest, also second harvest. Um, and again, reflecting the second harvest being brought in all over the Northern hemisphere. Other names for this, Mab, as in Queen Mab, yes, connected to the word Mabon, absolutely. We're going to talk about who that is in just a second. Also, Ishtar's Day. Um, uh, yeah, we'll get into that. Fall Equinox, as we've said, the Feast of Avalon. Um, Michael Mass is at this time of year, um, and that is a really big day for a lot of Catholic folks who work with um, the uh, Archangels. Um, Dojinki from our Slavic friends and ancestors, Heleg Monath from our Druid friends, Harvest Home, as in bringing the harvest home, Gwil Kanal Heidrif, Mian from Hair, which means literally middle harvest um, from our Irish, Ga Irish Gaelic friends, Alban Alfred, uh, also from our Druid friends, and Svorog's Day, dedicated to the god Svorog. Uh, another name here, Wine Harvest, and another name, Winter Finding. Um, and that name comes from uh, some of the groups that really only see two or three of the Sabbaths per year. It's kind of like we've hit the halfway mark. It's just cold from here on out, whatever. Winter's on its way. Um, so some of the other names. Okay. So this is our Sabbath sign. Um, this is, as far as I can tell, a modern pagan invention uh, there are eight signs for the Sabbaths. I found these somewhere a long time ago and then didn't see them again for a couple decades. And then when I started to teach these classes, in the back of my mind, I was like, I've seen symbols for the Sabbaths, haven't I? Hunted and hunted and hunted around on the internet until I finally found a graphic that had all eight of the symbols. Um, I think there might be a few books in print that have these. I can, I still, I think I've been teaching these classes since 2015, I still cannot find who created these or how they came to be. Um, so I, I assume that they are from somewhere in the last 100 years. I do not know who created them. I would love to know. Um, and I love that it's a new tradition. It sits with the idea of the wheel of a year as an eight piece thing, also being a modern pagan tradition, um, reflecting stuff from the past. And what I see in this is a bunch of stuff. I see, um, you know, corn stalks and grains that have grown and then are bending over with the heaviness of their ripeness. Um, the equal armed cross that we see so often in astrology and lots of other stuff as the sign of manifestation of like, this thing has come to pass. I also see ram's horns. Um, and there is some oblique connection to Aries in this season. So maybe I'm projecting that onto this, but um, I do see that in this. But I also like that you can work with this in a very really subjective way. We don't know exactly what it means. We don't know exactly what it's for or where it came from. And so use this as you would like to, um, because it's, it's kind of open-ended in terms of what the hell it is. <laughs> okay, um, before going forward, let me say this. Um, 
from the workbook, uh, the goddess is in her repose aspect or is about to be. Having just delivered a gigantic baby that is the fruit and vegetable crop all over the Northern Hemisphere. After resting from her labor, she begins to purify her transition from mother ultimately to crone. And that shift is also reflected in the holy days that we are going to see uh, as we move from here, September through October toward uh, Samhain. And the Holly King, AKA the dark twin is riding high, but dying on the waning year. As such, if they have not already, all vegetation gods and goddesses, but really all vegetation gods are dying or have already died. And all of our vegetation goddesses are transforming, they are changing shape, and most of them are beginning or have already started an underworld journey of a type. And this imagery is also really important when we're working with modern pagan interpretations of stuff that was happening in the past. Um, what we see very frequently is that deities that are depicted as gods die. They also are resurrected later on, or they are reborn in the body of a new god. Uh, but goddesses generally do not die. They might hibernate, they might go to sleep, they might disappear, they might transform into a different shape that's much more abstract and remote. They might go on an underworld journey and like take off for a while. But we generally see true and profound immortality in deities that are depicted as goddesses where we will see actual literal death and then usually a rebirth later on uh, in deities that are depicted as gods. I think that's, a, that's an important thing. Okay, so before we get into the next part of stuff, um, I wanna talk a little bit about the name of this holiday. Mabon, it's pronounced here in America, Mabon a lot. Um, Mabon is the correct pronunciation. And what we are saying in the word Mabon is a deity's name. Uh, outside of America, most people do not refer to this holiday as Mabin. In America, it is very common for people to refer to this holiday as Mabon or Mabin. I certainly have. Uh, this is one of the places where I'm evolving right now and I'm, I'm changing my practices around this. Um, where did that come from? Specifically, a person named Aidan Kelly uh, in cahoots with Starhawk, who I love, um, big fan of Starhawk's writings. If you haven't checked her out, please do. Um, Aiden Kelly was one of the folks that kind of cobbled together the eight part wheel of the year idea, had a big hand in making this a concept and making this a modern magical practice, especially for North American or American pagans. Um, and again, lots of people outside of America did not pick up on that practice. So here popular out there, people are like, what are you talking about? Um, so who is Mabin? Mabin Ap Modron is his actual name, and he is the son of the mothers. He is a Welsh Saxon deity, um, and uh, he has a light bringer type quality. I think of him as being kind of similar to like Angus MacOg or um, uh, Lou uh, of the Long Arms that Lunasad gets its name from. Um, or Lunasa. Uh, and he goes through a whole bunch of cool and crazy adventures, but that's ultimately where this word is coming from, is, is from this character who is a light and solar deity who goes through some trials and some tribulations and some issues before ultimately being saved by some other gods and, and brought back to his family. Um, and it's interesting because in, in his myth, we find, um, uh, well, within the, the, the King Arthur related version of this myth. Um, there's time shifting, there's fertility stuff, um, and there is an, a connection to Rhiannon and Epona and horses, and in particular, Hengist and Horsa, who are the horse brothers or lovers, um, who we meet in Gemini season at the very end of Beltane. So Mabon or Mabin, uh, Mabin at Modron is connected potentially to uh, these characters that ish that usher in 
uh, the end of the big fertility cycle uh, of, of Beltane and then ultimately the, the growth cycle that kicks off uh, in Letha or Litha season. So cool stuff there. Okay, what else do I have to say about that? Um, oh yeah, 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 all right. So am I gonna get, no, I'm not gonna get into all of it. Look up his myth uh, because there's a lot of really cool stuff in it. Um, I am going to move on actually to some of our folk practices of this time of year. And no, I'm not. Wait, am I? <laughs> I swear to God, I've done this before. <laughs> There's just always so much to cover that I'm like, which order do I do things in? Ah, um, let's do this. Let's do this. Okay. Um, what we're going to talk about briefly, did I pick the right window? I did. Hooray. Okay, cool. Um, are um, archaeo astronomical sites around the planet that reflect or observe the equinoxes? So this is. Uh, the Mayan pyramid, Chichen Itza, or no, excuse me, that's a lie. Uh, this is in Machu Picchu. This is in Tihuatana. The word means the place where the sun is tied. And in Machu Picchu stands this uh, carved rock. Um, and at the equinoxes, spring equinox and fall equinox, this middle piece here casts no shadow. The rest of the year, it casts a shadow of some site, site, uh, type and shape and size. Um, but at, at the equinoxes, like at the moments of the equinox, it does not cast a shadow. This is obviously carved on purpose. And, and you know, you can even see a step here or perhaps a seat of some kind. Um, so this was certainly a place of worship and a, and a moment for folks. Um, moving on to Chichen Itza. Uh, this is in uh, the Yucatan area of Mexico, um, most likely Mayan, pretty sure it's Mayan, approximately 1500 years old. I should say that uh, in Tihuatana, this is approximately 600 years old. So approximately 600 years ago, people observing here in um, Machu Picchu. Here in Yucatan, Mexico, uh, we have Chichen Itza. Uh, this is the um, Temple of Kukulkan is another name for this space. Um, and the phenomenon that this temple provides is pretty dope. On the fall equinox and the spring equinox, and you can see it here on the edge of the temple itself, this pyramid edge, exactly half of the pyramid is in shadow and exactly half of the pyramid is in sunlight reflecting our half and half gig that we are in um, uh, for the equinoxes. Pretty cool. And then uh, with this stair step shape, what you get along this staircase here is a ribbon of light that undulates over the course of the day. And it looks like a serpent rolling down or, or making its way down the staircase. There's something in the older name of this temple that has to do with uh, the sacredness of water or collecting water in this place. And some uh, uh, local archaeologists that are really familiar with um, uh, Mayan practices uh, say that there was a civilization before the Mayans here and that there may be a holy site uh, beneath or that was originally here before the pyramid was here. So this is a space in the Yucatan where folks may have been uh, recording the um, and observing the solstices and the equinoxes for an incredibly long time. This temple is approximately 1500 years old. Okay, moving to Lofcru. Uh, this is um, in Ireland. This site is approximately 4000 BCE. So give or take around 6,000 years old. And this is uh, a, a burial cairn uh, that is part of a complex of mountains, megalithic sites, cairns, and tombs called the Slivanage Kelich, uh, <laughs> which is 
loosely translated as the mountains of Kalich or Kilech. Um, and uh, this is another site where uh, the equinox itself is observed on the summer, or, or excuse me, on the fall equinox and the spring equinox. Um, sunlight comes into the very back of the tomb and illuminates these carvings and um, uh, other formations that are inside of this tomb. Moving backwards in time to Manadra, this is in Malta. Uh, this has become one of my favorite sites to study. I was really kind of blown away when I saw it. <laughs> um, and this temple complex also reflects the solstices as well as the fall and spring equinox. At fall and spring equinox, the light shines directly into the back of this temple. And at the winter and summer solstices, it hits the ones on the left and the right. Um, here is the entrance to that uh, great temple in the back. And here's an illustration of, of how the, the solar temple works. I don't have much more information about this space um, because you know it's approximately 6,000 years old, so we don't have a lot of recorded history around it. Uh, but we do have this incredible science that left that was left behind by our ancestors in this incredible creation of theirs. Going back a little bit further in time, uh, this is Cromlech of the Almendres. I love that Chrom is right there at the beginning of this word because one of our deities that we work with from our ancient uh, Gaelic, Irish, uh, Scottish ancestors is Crom Dub, who we meet at the end of Lunasad season. Um, uh, but this is a megalithic site that is in Portugal. This is also, um, uh, or excuse me, this is sixth millennia BCE, so approximately 8,000 years old. And this is a site that um, has been preserved well enough that uh, anthrop or archaeologists were able to discover that it has taken several shapes over time. And megalithic sites that were allowed to be for a long time and were utilized over the course of millennia, we have found, do in fact change shape. They were changed over time. Uh, and that is those ancient ancestor scientists uh, observing the precession of the equinoxes and observing that things in this in space time do in fact move and they needed to adjust things for heliacal risings of fixed stars and all of that good stuff um so we love that <laughs> so this is looking at it through time uh the messiest one down here in the bottom right is where it's at today um it started off with just this circle and then eventually uh, this oval was added and then even more layers to the oval were added. And then again, here's where we are today, 8,000 years ago, approximately. And uh, I talk about this spot a lot, but it really blows my mind. This is Nabta Playa in Southern Egypt. Uh, this site is approximately 9,500 years old. Um, I expect that it's probably older than that, but archaeology has a hard time going past 10,000 years on anything. <sighs> and, <laughs> and yet, get over it. Um, <laughs> um, megalithic site, this marks uh, equinoxes, solstices, uh, heliacal risings of fixed stars, um, rolling the sky back through time. We can see that it matches up with a bunch of stuff. And... Uh, Recent discoveries, or not so recent, because I've talked about this before, but recent discoveries uh, have found the the carving of a uh, cow-headed goddess in this area who looks remarkably similar to Hathor, a deity that we think of as modern, not so modern, ancient Egyptian in the 4,000-ish year range. And so this might be a site that uh, is not only dedicated to that goddess, but it might be also showing that this is a goddess that humans were working with or have been working with for approximately 10,000 years. No big deal, guys, just that. Um, so we can see that um, this has been a big deal for humans for a long ass time. <laughs> marking the equinoxes, marking the solstices, a really big deal for humans for a really, really long time. Um, okay, so moving into just the plain old science of it all, let me show you this. 
hey, I pulled up the right one again. Look at me. Okay. So this is, you know, don't sue me, British Botanica. I don't know where I stole this from, but encyclopedia, whatever. Um, this is a general uh, description of what our planet is doing as we move around the sun. Where we are currently is here in the lower left-hand corner, autumn, spring for the Southern hemisphere. Um, and we are going to go clockwise around the circle. No, we're not, sorry. We're going counterclockwise around the circle um, in our movement around the sun. Makes perfect sense, right? Um, but this is approximately what's happening for us. Equal night, equal day. Um, and you can see because of that tilt, the sunlight is distributed in a weird way. It's not exactly lining up with the poles. Um, and so here is another description of that. Uh, on top, we have summer solstice. Uh, bottom right, we have winter solstice. Bottom left, we have the equinoxes. Um, and so we can see that it is coming from, uh, you know, straight on. And it's as evenly distributed as it's going to be on the equinoxes. And then the tilt takes over and one part of the planet gets more light and one part of the planet gets less or more darkness. So one of the phenomenon that, that this creates for us is something called the alem analemna. And that is this. This is the shape that is created in the sky by the sun over the course of time due to this tilt. Now, obviously we're not seeing the sun literally make this shape in the sky. I'm sure we all probably would have noticed that by now. Um, what we're talking about is if we tracked uh, the sun at noon, for example, or three o'clock in the afternoon, pick any time, it really doesn't matter. And we took a picture of the sun in the sky at the exact same time every single day, it would trace this shape in the sky. I have a photograph of that for you here in just a second. Um, but as you can see at the top for us in the Northern hemisphere, this is the summer solstice up here at the top. And then the sun starts to come down, it crosses over. So it's on the left initially, and then it crosses over, moves to the right. And here where the circle is, this is approximately uh, fall equinox. This is September here. And then it's going to continue to scooch down pretty quickly um, on the right until we get to the very bottom, which is uh, winter solstice. And then it is going to continue back up again on the left-hand side, moving through, passing through spring equinox, and then it crosses over uh, between um, spring equinox and Beltane basically, and then continues up the right-hand side back up to the top summer solstice. And so here is a photograph of that. This is a photograph that was taken once a week, uh, every week for an entire year at the same time of day. And we see this pattern. Um, this pattern is created by the tilt in our planet, uh, the wobble of our, of our spin, um, it would be pointing straight up and down, I believe, if the person had taken the picture at uh, uh, noon every day. Um, if they had taken it closer to sunrise, it would be pointing in the other direction. Um, and all of that stuff. Uh, this shape is something that we see a lot, right? It's an infinity symbol, <laughs> kind of cool. Um, and the other thing that it always makes me that it always makes me think of that it always reminds me of is the shape of uh, the hat that we see in some magician cards, and it's the shape of the hat that the uh, Gemini um, horse riders would wear, um, with that sort of floppy one up one down kind of thing. I don't know. Again, I might just be projecting that onto this, but the first time I saw it, I was like, "Wait, that's the." Oh, <laughs> that's the thing. And that's what happens, kids, when you do this for too long, you just start to go crazy. <laughs> but anyways, I think that this is really cool and an incredible natural phenomenon and absolutely something that our ancient ancestor scientists would have noticed and would have been able to record um, and talk to each other about and discuss and puzzle over and be influenced by and ultimately potentially incorporate this shape or this design into magical teachings 
that they were sharing with each other on how do we grow food and how do we stay alive and how do we do the thing? What's up with all of that stuff? Okay, so let us now move into what next? Oh my goodness, do I wanna do the sky guide next? Um, yeah, okay, we're gonna flip back and forth a little bit. We're going out of order a little bit this time. Okay, here is our sky guide. Here's our pertinent dates for Maybon season. Um, you'll notice we are starting off at September 7th because I think of the torrid meteor showers as something that extends from Lunasa season through Mabin, through Samhain, uh, and almost carries us all the way to Yule. So it really is overseeing kind of the entirety of the fall season. Um, if we look down, we also have uh, the Orionid meteor showers, and we also have the Jacketed meteor showers at this time of year as well. And something that I have discovered in doing this work is uh, anytime that we have a pile of meteor shower stuff, we also have ancestor work. Ancestors and meteor showers tend to go hand in hand. So isn't it an interesting coincidence, right? During fall, and especially at Samhain season, what are we doing? Lots and lots and lots of ancestor worship or appeasement, right? <laughs> depending on the relationships there. Um, and, you know, what do we have? Three different meteor showers on top of each other at this time of year. So I'm sure it's just a coincidence. Um, September 22nd, the sun moves into Libra for our tropical astrology friends. September 25th this year will be our first new moon of fall at three degrees of Libra. We will talk about the granular parts of this in all of our podcasts that we're going to have every week. Um, but think about that. That's really cool timing that we have the sun moving into Libra and we have our first new moon uh, of fall and our Libra new moon almost on top of each other. That's some really cool timing that our lunar cycle is more or less matching our solar cycle as we move through this season. Love it. Um, I don't mention uh, the planetary retrogrades and directs too often unless we are in a season that is directly related to the planet. But I do mention this Mercury moving into direct, moving direct or stationing direct at 25 degrees of Virgo, October 2nd, because we are just stepping out of uh, Virgo season. And I do really think of Virgo as being embedded in a lot of our uh, Mavin work. Um, and so mentioning that, uh, that the planetary ruler of one of these signs is going to be stationing direct. So if you've been feeling like I can't get my labor going. <laughs> we may have um, some movement at that point slash maybe this will be a good day for folks that I don't know, work on the railroad. Hmm. <laughs> don't be mad at the supply chain people. Be mad at the railroad owners. You know me. There's always going to be a leftist rant somewhere. It's OK if you're frustrated that you can't get <laughs> peas and corn at this time of year. Um, but be mad at the railroad barons, not the workers. Uh, who are just fighting for a couple of freaking sick days. Uh, anyways, moving on. Um, we have a few heliacal risings of fixed stars, Algarab, Spica, and Arcturus. Spica is one of the big time fixed stars that we find in the sign of Virgo. So here again, here's our Virgo energy. And when we are working with not tropical astrology, but sidereal <laughs> astrology, which matches astronomy, uh, we are, in fact, a sign behind, as it were, or a sign ahead. Tropical is a sign ahead. Sidereal is a sign behind or is on time. Um, and so, technically speaking, Mabon season or fall equinox season does, in fact, come under the auspices of Virgo and not so much Libra. Um, on October 9th, we will have our first full moon of fall at 17 degrees of Aries. Um, and, and I think I already said this, but in case I didn't say it explicitly, uh, Mavin season or fall equinox season does bring in our first new moon and our first full moon of the fall portion of the wheel. And then on October 22nd, the sun will be moving into Scorpio. And on October 25th, we have a new moon at two degrees of Scorpio. So Samhain season at least the first part of it is also going to roll pretty nicely. The solar and lunar patterns are going to line up pretty nicely with each other. We also have 
uh, the beginning of eclipse season happening then. Obviously, I'm going to talk about this way more when we get closer to Samhain and we actually move into Scorpio season and the energies are a little more spicy, um, but heads up, pre-warning here, <laughs> this is what's going on. Um, but keep these dates in mind as we now talk about um, the global themes and our global holidays that we have coming up at this time of year. Let me pause momentarily. Anybody have any questions, comments? And I've been fire hosing information at you for a freaking hour. <laughs> You're like, wait, we're talking, we're doing things. I've been writing as fast as I can, or just letting me drone on in the background. Either way is fine. Um, okay. Oh. Yay. Yay. Mwah. Yes. Love you too. Okay. So when we look around the planet at what the hell is going on, we see a lot of this stuff reflected in the things that everybody else is doing past and present. Abundance, healing, ocean worship, ancestor worship, and a new year is also starting for a lot of folks. Um, and I love that imagery. Uh, Samhain is often referred to as witch's new year. Uh, but that's here in fall as well, right? That's just four-ish, five-ish weeks from now. Um, yeah, it is. In fact, the beginning of November is like um, five weeks away. So <laughs> that's how it rolls at this time of year. It's like, wait, what? <laughs> time, crazy. Um, so looking through the stuff that we have going on at this time of year, on uh, the equinox or around the equinox itself, kind of that like, uh, September 18th to September 22nd or September 24th, you know, that kind of little chunk of time. We have Quayarena from our Inca friends and ancestors, the Jinki, who I already, which I already mentioned. We have the death of Damuzi or Tammuz from our Babylonian friends and ancestors, um, who is a vegetation god, of course. We have the death of uh, Tiamat as well, one of the few goddesses that dies at this time of year, but really we can also say that she changes shape. Um, we have the day of Obatala from our Santeria and Yoruba land, uh, friends and ancestors. And these are all like packed in right around this actual day. Um, what else? Oh yeah. My notes on Koya Reina. Uh, this is connected to uh, Chichen Itza and our serpent of light, um, rainbow serpent stuff that we were seeing at that temple. Um, but other holy days that are happening at this time of year, we have Michael Mass from our Catholic friends and ancestors. We have the Feast of Bacchus from our Roman friends and ancestors, aka Dionysus from our Greek friends and ancestors. We have Durga Puja from our Hindu friends and ancestors, and this connects us to Navratri, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, Wimi Kawari from our Iroquois friends and ancestors. This is a squash festival that happens approximately at this time of year. Um, we also have a lot of pretty intense underworld journeys. So going through all of this stuff throughout September and October, we have harvest festivals and then underworld journeys. Um, we have the harvest moon festival of Chang O. Oh, this celebration is dedicated to the Chinese moon goddess Chang O. Oh. Uh, this is one of the coolest times of year to look at the moon. As far as I'm concerned, <laughs> our full moons at this time of year are pretty cool. Um, there are uh, folks light lanterns and they go out with friends and family to literally just watch the moon rise and have an evening picnic and enjoy nature. <laughs> Goddess forbid, right? Um, folks make little moon cakes, which are little uh, cakes and, and cookies that are de de decorated to look like the moon and give those out as gifts. Um, and there is a real element of nostalgia for a lot of people with this festival as well, which I think, you know, kind of harkens to this idea of summer is ending. We're reflecting back on um, the high points of this year so far, um, but also connecting with ancestors and connecting with the past. Another uh, holiday that is kind of a big deal at this time of year is, wait, come back, sorry. <laughs> My, uh, Computer was just like, nope, I'm just going to go to sleep now. I was like, wait, please don't. Um, I'm still, I'm still doing things. 
is the Eleusinian Mysteries. Uh, the Eleusinian Mysteries this year are running from September 12th to September 18th. So they are actually happening right now. Um, they are holiday. This is a holiday festival complex moment uh, from our ancient Greek friends and ancestors. It can happen a little bit earlier in September, but all the way into deep into October. So it's always somewhere around fall equinox, sometimes before, sometimes on, sometimes after, but you're not going to find it in spring. You're not going to find it in the heart of winter. It's always going to be at this time of year. And this festival uh, is really intense um, or was really intense for ancient Greeks. This was a rite of passage. This was an initiatory practice. And a lot of uh, archeologists and anthropologists that have studied the, the Eleusinian mysteries now believe that uh, along with it simply being like an age oriented rite of passage where people were sort of inducted from childhood into adulthood, that it also was teaching people the mysteries of uh, agriculture basically how to store grains, how to treat seeds, how to plant things correctly, how to water them correctly, how to offer the correct sacrifices and offer the correct ablutions and propitiations to the deities and to the forces of nature themselves. Um, it centers symbolically around uh, Kor or Persephone uh, and her mother Demeter. And uh, we talked a little bit about this in the um, in the uh, podcast this week. Um, and uh, what else do I want to say about this? Okay. Um, first off, definitely an ag agrarian uh, harvest uh, growth cycle, uh, mystery complex, festival complex, um, definitely chthonic, uh, definitely something that had to do with connecting the overworld and the underworld, or the world of the living and the world of the dead, the world of brightness, the world of darkness, the world of known, the world of unknown, the world of us here and living with the world of the ancestors and the past. Um, it may have come from um, Minoan folks or Mycenaean folks. Um, the lesser mysteries happened somewhere around February. I talked about this a little bit in the podcast, but I'm repeating myself. Um, uh, this happened, the lesser mysteries would happen in February. And sometimes folks went through the lesser mysteries and then had to wait a whole year and a half before they got to join in with the greater mysteries. The lesser mysteries were intended to sort of initiate people into the, the basics of the practice, teach them the lines that they were going to have to memorize and all of that stuff. But a lot of the Eleusinian mysteries uh, were not known until they were actually experienced. And People were not allowed to talk about them after they had gone through them. This was a secret that Attic Greeks kept to themselves. Um, so while it was thought that it was incredibly important that people went through this process, they also couldn't talk about what they had experienced. Um, they had to just live it, which I think is kind of cool. Um, everyone was allowed entry into this practice except murderers and people who could not speak Greek. So as long as you could speak Greek and you hadn't killed somebody, you were expected to go through this, or at the very least, you were welcome to go through it. That uh, is more in ancient Greece. As we get into the, the later eras of Greece, it was something that was paid for and attended by the elite and the richest families of, of, uh, of the Greek populaces. Um, you had to take a vow of secrecy. Um, and uh, one of the, a little bit of information has come out about this. Um, one of the passages is an ear of grain in silence reaped, which I don't know, that's just cool. And it's good to know, it's, it's cool to be able to repeat words that people were saying 3000 years ago. That's kind of dope. Um, the practice started at the ocean. Um, where people would get a baby pig that they took to bathe in the ocean. And then that little pig was brought back and sacrificed. Sorry, vegans. Um, and that connects us to a even larger all year cycle uh, where um, 
that little pig is ultimately thrown into a chthonic chamber or an underground chamber that was dedicated to Ceres, the goddess of grain. Um, and that pit was filled with snakes and other things, which we see here in this image, um, and other things, grains and other uh, sacrificed plants and, and stuff, uh, and just left to do its thing in the underground. And then in February, uh, farmers would come and get buckets full of that ook uh, to use as fertilizer. It was blessed and, um, uh, you know, granted to these folks to be able to spread over their fields. And so there is this idea of sort of carrying the magic through from one piece of the cycle to the next. Um, but it started at the ocean um, or sometimes maybe a graveyard, depends on which source you're looking at. And people would be swinging branches, which we are seeing here in this image. And at some point they would be given a drink called Kikion. We love a little, little sip sip of some Kikion. What is Kikion? It is a barley drink. Um, it was made, in it, the base of it was made from soaking barley in water. Um, other things like grated goat cheese, who doesn't love a little goat cheese, right? In your beverage, wine, and then drugs, lots and lots of drugs, poppy heads, which we see in this image, and mushrooms which we see these two goddesses, Kor and Demeter, or Persephone and Demeter, handing to each other, goddess bless. <laughs> also, in my opinion, uh, and, and other people's opinions, I've definitely read this in a few sources, this is not for certain, but it's believed potentially that part of what was taught in the mysteries was how to grow ergot on rye or barley. Ergot is the organic basis of what we now know as LSD. Just a little, you know, <laughs> just a little ripple in your tipple, right? Uh, <laughs> are we going to party? Yeah, we are, like 1999, as a matter of fact. Um, and so that also might have been some of the things that people were learning was how to cultivate this very particular plant helper or this very particular fungus helper on our plants. And also probably how to not have that happen, right? Because let's roll forward a couple thousand years and we have the Salem witch trials. So ergot, not always like a welcome friend in all of our fall festivities, uh, you know, Christians, they just don't know how to handle their drugs. I mean, that's, that's, I'm just going to say, I'm going to say it. I'll take, I'll be the hot take tonight. I'm going to say it. Uh, but in this practice, uh, it was a five or seven day process. There was sleep deprivation. There was a little bit of uh, adult beverage with some added bonus pop rock moment. Um, and they were uh, brought from room to room in various temples and they were shown things and uh, commanded to say stuff or invited to say stuff and to make gestures, to make sacrifices and offerings. And also they received things Again, we really don't know because so much of this was kept secret. Um, uh, one of my favorite quotes from this, do I have it written down? I hope I do. Oh yeah. Um, uh, at some point in the process of going through the mysteries, the initiate would say, I have fasted. I have drunk the Kikion. I have taken things out of the big basket and after performing the sacred rite, I have put them in the little basket. Whence I then put them back in the big basket. You know what I'm talking about. I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know what that means. No one knows what that means, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> so putting stuff in baskets, getting high, that's, that's what fall is all about. I mean, it's witchcraft, people. I don't know what you want from me. Okay. Um, we know that this also is, you know, tied in, obviously, with the Demeter-Persephone myth of Persephone being taken down into the depths. Um, and as I talked about in, as I have talked about in several classes in the past, um, and uh, as I've talked about in the podcast this week, Part of this story is really gnarly. One of the versions of this myth is really gross, where Demeter is kidnapped by the god Hades 
and taken down into his lairs and assaulted. She's sexually assaulted. Um, and, uh, you know, Demeter is fraught with misery and, um, and anger and shuts down all life on earth and the other Greek gods get involved. And ultimately a bargain is struck between Hades and Demeter that Hades gets Persephone half of the year, Demeter gets Persephone half of the year. And of course, as I pointed out in that myth, nobody's asked Persephone what she wants to do. But the further back we push into time, and I said this in the podcast, I know I keep saying that, but it's weird for me to repeat myself. Um, uh, If we push back far enough in time, we can find versions of this myth where Persephone is going willingly. She's not kidnapped. She's like, hey, check it out. I'm like, I used to be a little girl. I'm not so little anymore. And uh, I would like to be inducted into the mysteries if that's cool. And, you know, the owner of the goth club comes up and is like, hey, chick, what's up? Let's take some Molly. Let's have a good time. Whatever your thing is, you know, don't do drugs, kids. But if you do, do Kiki on. Um, But uh, but she goes willingly. She's basically saying, I'm, I was a little girl. I'm not a little girl anymore. I'm growing into an adult and I want to be initiated into the mysteries. I want to know what it is to be an adult. Right. And, and sex in and of itself is a great mystery and it is an initiatory moment. It is a, also a liminal space we could say, right. Because it's a type of threshold where once we cross over, we, that's it. Right. And, and it doesn't exist in, we can't point at the physical place in time where that change happens in us and physically nothing really is different afterwards but we are entirely different people and it's something that we can't unknow right so we we transform in that moment i mean it's very sacred and it's really awesome um but and if we push back even further into time, we find that Hades is not even really part of the mix anymore it is Hecate the crone And so let's think back to our basic symbolism around Mabin and fall equinox. We have maiden at spring, mother all through the summer part uh, and the high part of the year, and now just beginning to uh, touch base with and introduce the crone. And this is Persephone, who becomes, of course, the queen of the lands of the dead, the goddess of the lands of the dead, um, saying, I am legion, I am multifold, I am many pieces, I'm many things. And this is me accepting a new part of my power, a new level of my wisdom, a new understanding of myself and my capacity. And it's also a thing, a moment of recognizing I will not be young forever. There will be things in me that are of my youth and I am changing and I am moving into different places in my life. Um, And so accepting the totality of the cycle of human existence just little things like that <laughs> is really what we're talking about, I think, in the Eleusis Mysteries and um, and uh, and what it is that we're doing or what we can be doing with our fall energy. There's, you know, obviously a lot of emphasis on the idea of production and, uh, you know, abundance and all of that stuff. But underneath that, there is also a suggestion of changing shape and moving through maturity and experiences that mature us and call on us to step into power um, and to ultimately see ourselves almost from the opposite end of the telescope. Um, Something that I love to say in spring is that we should be willfully ignorant. We should be willfully naive, curious. I don't know any better. I'm going to go taste that. I'm going to go try that. I'm going to go get it on me and see what happens. Here at the opposite end, at fall equinox, the the other side of it, um, we are willfully stepping into what we do know. And we are willfully stepping into knowing even more and embracing how much we know, how much power we have, how much capacity we have. Uh, A lot of Lunasad season is really focused on you know, initially stepping into those concepts. And now here in Mabin season or fall equinox, it's like, okay, I'm really coming into settling in to being a more mature version of myself because I've got hard work in front of me. Um, The labor was tough, but getting through winter might even be harder. So what do I need to know that's a little dark? What do I need to know that's a little more somber, a little more serious? Can I get comfortable with the idea that some folks are going to possibly die off during winter, that I'm lands are going to die off, like that pieces of me are going to evolve and die off too. 
that stuff. Okay, other things that we are doing uh, at this time of year are, um, sorry, <laughs> let me see here, do, do, do. do that, close that. And can you see that? I hope everybody can see that. I think you probably can. Um, other holidays that we are celebrating at this I, at this time of year, Navratri. Uh, this is from our Hindu friends and ancestors. Navratri this year is going to run from September 26th to October 5th. Um, let's briefly look back at our sky guide. Hey, September 26th, that's the day after the first new moon. I must be connected, I wonder, huh? Um, and Navratri is the dark half of the year, New Year's for Hindus. Not all Hindus, but a majority of them. This is a huge religious celebration, but it is also a cultural celebration for a lot of Hindi folks um, and people in the Indian subcontinent. Um, this is primarily dedicated to uh, worshiping and venerating and celebrating the goddesses Durga, Saraswati, and Lakshmi. Durga is a great warrior goddess who connects us to Aries season. Aries, of course, being the opposing sign to Libra. Crazy, I know. Saraswati is our, um, Durga is also a warrior. I should say that. She's a fighter. She's an incredible protector. Saraswati is a, a goddess of knowledge and skills. Um, if I had to think of a goddess that was, you know, similar to her, I'm going to call on Bridget again, um, a craftsperson, uh, smart, teaches people a lot of stuff, um, but also uh, Lou's mother, um, Epona. Sorry, Lou, I forget the name of your mom. Um, but another craftsperson that teaches agricultural skills to their people. Um, and Lakshmi, a goddess of abundance and prosperity and joy and plenty. Um, but also, this is ushering in the dark half of the year. Uh, and so after all of those other goddesses are venerated, it's Kali's time to shine. And uh, at the very end of Navratri uh, is a big feast and a big collection of days that is dedicated to the celebration of Kali. I might be a little biased there. Um, things like light lamp, lamp lighting and, and putting up strings of lights, buying a new piece of clothing, bringing something new into the house, having feasts with friends and family and that kind of stuff to kind of indicate the idea of like, we're stepping into a new portion of the year. But that newness thing, that new year's thing is something that we see the Greeks do, the Romans did it, where they literally um, have a festival at uh, one of Jupiter's temple, Jupiter's stator, where they actually take a nail and nail the new year to the side of the temple with the calendar going forward. And also from our Jewish friends and ancestors, we have Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, Yom Kippur and Sukkot, um, which all begin the Jewish new year. This year, uh, we are in year 5783. Um, and that whole complex of festivals and holidays starts September 5th and rolls through October 9th. So again, in alignment with our new moons and our full moons. Um, and then, uh, and then through these very joyful acknowledgments of the new dark half of the year, um, we also begin to see, uh, underworld journeys taking place. So we have the underworld journey of Osiris happening at this time. We have the underworld journey of Inanna and Ishtar, which is one of my favorite myths to talk about. Um, one of my absolute favorite holidays uh, this year from October 7th to 9th from our Greek friends and ancestors is Thesmophoria, the bitching festival. <laughs> I have a big old piece about this festival up on my website, and it is uh, dedicated to, um, well, a lot of stuff, but it's dedicated to laborers kind of saying, you know what, I've been working hard enough, screw you, I'm going to go party out of town. And literally, uh, women across the board and femmes would uh, get bundles of this particular plant. I, I have it written down somewhere and I don't uh, know where it is, unfortunately, but they would get this particular plant that represented chastity and they would make, they would fashion like dollies out of them and uh, 
plant them in bed where they would normally sleep. They grab all their stuff, grab the booze out of the kitchen, grab all the good food and hike out to the hills and go party for three days with just each other out in the hills. And they were like, you can run town. You can raise the kids. You can figure it out. <laughs> I, I absolutely love that this is in alignment with our potential massive uh, nationwide railroad strike that might be coming up here. Like, hmm, I'm sure it's just a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. This is how magic works. <laughs> um, so we have Thesmophoria, the bitching festival, and this is sort of a breaking down of the traditional roles, right? And the breaking down of the of the, of the traditional um, systems upon which society is built. And as we move through, we see hol more holidays dedicated to Krom Dub, the old crooked dark one. Um, we have uh, October 13th, which is the day of Eris, Eris being the twin sister of Ares or Mars, um, and is the goddess of chaos and strife and discord, goddess bless. Um, and so these holidays are welcoming in the breaking down of the natural order, which is just a psychological reflection of what is being witnessed in the natural world as the natural order begins to break down. Fruits stop producing on trees, vegetables stop producing on vines, animals, again, stop mating, going into hibernation or they migrate away, insects migrating away, birds, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, all of these systems that we've come to expect and celebrate and rely on over the last six months, whoop, they're done. They're done supporting us and they're moving on. So that is our global stuff looking backwards and forwards through time. Um, we've talked a bit about our sky guide. So now let me move on to this. No, this. Uh, here are our constellations that we are working with at this time of year. Um, I've already mentioned uh, these are our first new and full moons at this time of year. Already talked about all the meteor showers that we have going at this time of year. Um, is there anything else I want to say about this in specific? I feel like I've covered a lot of this already, actually. Um, let me pull it up for you like so. Woo, there we go. That's not what I wanted you to do. That's also not what I wanted you to do. Do that, there we go. Okay, robots. Just bigger, it's literally the same image, just bigger. Here's Spica uh, down on Virgo's butt. Or, and Spica is the handful of grains that uh, Virgo is holding. And Vindemiatrix up at the top is a handful of grapes or vines, uh, grape vines that Virgo is holding. So here we have this producer goddess that is like, boom, I've got grapes and grains right here in my hand. We're going to eat, we're going to drink, we're having a great time. That sweetness, I've got salty, we're good to go. Um, and then ultimately moving into Libra season. I kind of go more hard on these guys a little bit in some other classes. I'm just not feeling it today. <laughs> it's not that I'm not feeling it. I just have other things I want to talk about because it always goes this way. <laughs> but you know what? I am actually going to read this. Um, some notes on uh, the scales. The constellation of Libra is thought to be scales by some cultures held aloft by Virgo, interestingly enough. For a while, uh, Libra was included in Scorpio as the claws of the scorpion. But going even further back, we see this portion of the sky, these stars, what we call this constellation, as a lamp or an incense sensor, and sometimes even an altar upon which things would have been offered, all either held up by Virgo or Scorpio, or sometimes both. And that is a really potent image. Thinking of Virgo on one side and Scorpio on the other side, you know, there's a whole lot of really, um, reductive imagery from one particular belief system that's out there that talks about women or femmes either presenting as virgins or whores. Hmm, I don't know where I picked that up from, but I'm sure it has nothing to do with this symbolism that's incredibly old. 
<clears throat> as the scales, it was known as the balance, the weight, or the wage. The word Libra means pounds, as in a weight or a measurement in Greek. Archaeologists found Libra pressed into the coins found at Palmyra. Many poets over the centuries have reinforced the idea of scales by suggesting the seasons are measured out and evened out here. It has also been called staphmos, which means station or way beam, referring to the stillness of a level scale. And so it's, again, that equal, that equal equity or equality point, right, before the, the scales tip again. When we think of the image of Virgo holding up the scales, we are met with the archetype of justice depicted in the justice card, which does come under the auspices of Libra. Um, but interestingly, this constellation was sometimes called Biki, which means a trial or to weigh or to judge. As a lamp, we see the Hindus refer to this constellation as fire. The people of the Euphrates called it a lamp or a censer. Coptic Egyptians called it lamvadia or lamp. And again, we have these lamp lighting holidays that are happening at this time of year. When we consider the image of Virgo holding up a lamp, we get the hermit card in tarot ruled by Virgo. Now, here's just a, a philosophical moment for you. How is a lamp like a set of scales? Think of the law represented by the lamp held up by the hermit and the law represented by the scales held up by justice. The Chinese call this constellation the celestial balance, but originally this was the crocodile or even the dragon. Still other civilizations saw this sign as the chariot's yoke, referring to Pluto's chariot as he makes off with Virgo, Persephone, Proserpina, Kor. So on the note of uh, tarot, let me stop that for a moment and pull up this, not that one, you go away. Come to me now, thank you. Robots, assemble. Let me show you this. Here are our tarot helpers from the Builders of the Adidam deck. This is Virgo and Libra. So we have the Hermit and the Magician. Hermit, Virgo, Magician, connecting to Mercury, the ruling planet of Virgo. And then on the other side, we have Libra. So we have the Empress, which connects us to Venus, which is the ruling planet of Libra, represented by Justice. And what... One of the things that I think is really interesting here is um, that we have, uh, this is the second time that we are hanging out with the magician and the empress. The first time being Gemini season or Beltane season as we move from Taurus into Gemini. Taurus is ruled by Venus, empress. Gemini is ruled by Mercury, the magician. So at the very start of all of this stuff, we are hanging out with these two characters and here in the height, but as we begin to wane and, and wrap up this whole harvest festival situation, we're back with these two. Um, so let me read a bit about these. Summer's waning light illuminates facets of our deeds over the year so far. And we would do well to take a moment to try to see what it is the universe is trying to point out. As a species, we have forgotten that we are meant to be window panes that allow the light to shine through. We have forgotten to be the light and to be conductors of the light. We could be stewards for each other and the planet. 
as we pull in the harvest, we have a chance to pull back and think about our connection and our responsibility to our real personal power, to the future, the present. What is your responsibility for building a better now? And if we all began to consider that and work towards it, what kind of a world could we be producing? The last time we hung out with the magician and the empress was during Beltane. At that point, we had just thrown a bunch of seeds in the ground and we were eagerly tending our gardens, wondering what could grow. We had no idea at the time what those experiments could turn into or the actions we would have to take to turn dreams into reality. Now we are at the opposite end of that energy. We are looking over our crops. We are looking over our results. And we are weighing the efficacy and the morality of our actions. We might be tempted into inaction. Don't rock the boat. Don't look too closely at these situations or we'll be obligated to deal with them. But choosing to not deal with our crap is just prolonging the inevitable. And when we do choose to take action and face our path, we are changed and molded by it. In addition to becoming active co-creators of reality. Memory is the bedrock in which imagination finds its seeds. However, it is action that turns the wheel, just like the millstone. All the actions we take in the conscious world are somehow influenced by unconscious movements that we make, which are in turn influenced by our experiences and what we take from them. And that is this cyclical nature of time and the cyclical nature of our lives. We think about it, we move on it, things happen that influences our thoughts and our feelings, which then influence our actions, which then influence our thoughts and our feelings, and, and, and. And so any time that we stop and decide to deal with the hard parts, the yucky parts, the weird parts, the uncomfortable parts, the ultimately better we are going to make it for ourselves and for everybody else. The more we choose to be co-creators of our reality and producers of the best possible, not only future, but now, the better it actually becomes. And is that hard work? Yeah. And is it disappointing? Totally. Is it frustrating? Mm -hmm. Quite a bit. Yes. And still, and still, it's ours to choose to do. And you have free will. You don't have to participate in that. You can just go along with whatever those people decide to churn up. But uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know if you've looked outside lately, but um, <laughs> when assholes are in charge, it doesn't turn out really good. <laughs> it's kind of a bummer. <laughs> and so here these cats are to remind us that even if the physical world work seems to be at its peak and then we're ultimately going to be wrapping that stuff up, we are still creating, we are still attending, we are still producing, um, and we will be, in a sense, throughout the entirety of the wheel with some rests here and there. Um, but it just changes shape a little bit. Uh, it changes places where it is that we're doing the work. We've been doing the work in the overworld. We're now going to be doing the work in the underworld, in the lands of the dead, in the subconscious realms, the unconscious realms, um, working with the past, working with the future, um, and working with fear, working with shame, working with guilt. Those are the seeds that we may or may not be planting at this time of year. Um, and you know, how's that hit, right? <laughs> What's that do for you? <laughs> Does it freak you out? That's fine. It's okay. Um, briefly, I mean, we got about 20 minutes left. Um, let me close that and bring us into some of our astrology um, for our moon work at this time of year. 
as pre mentioned, <laughs> uh, we are working with our new moon in Libra and our full moon in Aries. And again, I love that our lunar and solar cycles are kind of syncing up for our holiday this year. That's freaking cool. Love. It doesn't always do that. We sometimes start out with a full moon right off the bat. And it's like, wait, that's what? Huh? Um, but we get to work with the increase and the decrease uh, in, in, in the pattern. It's pretty cool. Um, and at the Newman in Libra, I'm going to encourage you to do all kinds of work. But uh, this in particular, I encourage you to think about where did you learn the difference between right and wrong? Like, what do those words mean? Those are huge concepts. And what were your first introductions to those concepts? What was the first time in your life that you had to wrangle with the, the philosophical idea of rightness and wrongness? And have your understanding, has your understanding of those ideas evolved or changed over time? Or as I casually put here, are you holding on to naivety in search of peace? <laughs> and why do I, why am I mean with that? <laughs> because one of the things that we can default to during Libra season is um, harmony and diplomacy over addressing the yucky parts and ultimately untangling the threads in the tapestry and making it really good, like actually good. Libra season sometimes is like, ah, let's just say whatever this person wants to hear. Let me just do whatever needs to get done and just keep it rolling and keep it cute and keep it, keep it light. Um, and there can, and, and yet we're moving into the hard part of the year, right? We're moving into the darkness. We're moving into the shadow realms. Uh, Samhain will be here before you know it. Yule is going to be here before you know it. And those are times of year where if nothing else, psychologically, um, there's a big shift for a lot of folks. Seasonal affective disorder is one of the symptoms of that psychological shift. And, um, and you know, I don't, again, I don't know if you've been outside, but there's like a couple things going on in the world today that's like a little like, oh, right. And so, <laughs> but the longer we ignore that, the longer that we just binge Netflix, the longer that we shop our way to happiness, which is all Libra stuff. Let me just stare at art. Let me watch my favorite movies again. Let me, uh, you know, buy a new couch or buy a new t-shirt or buy a new bra because, you know, that's just going to make me happy today. The longer we engage in that stuff, the, the more we put off the work of why are there still homeless people? Why can't railroad workers get a sick day? Why are teachers striking? Um, and, and dealing with that is uncomfortable. It is, um, uh, it's inconvenient, right? It's scary. Um, it shows us the cracks in the foundation of our society. It shows us the flaws in the bedrock of the, the, the precedents, you know, the philosophical underpinnings of what it is to be America or be whatever country you're in. Um, and and it's, it's, it's uncomfortable way before it ever gets to being comfortable. And it's kind of, it almost feels like sometimes we have to walk backwards before we get to walk forwards in that work. And yet we know that when we address this earnestly and we sit with what's not working and we either dismantle it or we go through the work of repairing it, that we get the chance to replace it with something that actually works for everyone, that makes sense for the most amount of people. The, the, the process or one of the processes that we use to address that stuff is things like democracy, but democracy isn't the best thing ever, right? There's, there's stuff beyond democracy. This has gotten us here. That's cool, but there's still flaws even in that, right? And, and it's possibly uncomfortable for you to hear me say that, like, what? Oh, God. <laughs> really? I thought that was one of the ones we could lean on. Nope. Sorry. It's a human invention. You know, there's going to be problems with it somewhere. Um, also not a political science major. Okay. So again, lady on the internet yelling, but, um, but the point being that even the things that are pretty, even the things that taste good, even the things that are comfortable to us may not be serving us in the best possible way. They may not be in the best interest of the best now 
that we could be enjoying, let alone the best future that we could be producing for future generations. And so even and especially challenging some of our most sacred beliefs, some of our most sacred traditions to just question it and say, could this be better? Does this need to be replaced? Like, does this need to be broken down and used as fertilizer for the next growth cycle, right? Is this a little pig that needs to go in the underground? I can think of a, no. <laughs> I'll just show you my ACAB sticker and we'll move on. Okay. Uh, full moon in, in Aries at 16 degrees on October 9th. Again, this is in alignment with a whole bunch of our holy days that we have coming up. And here is where you know, we put a bit of a finer point on that stuff. Consider all that there is to fight for in this world. What does it look like to be a fierce and loving warrior, even when you have to go alone, even when you don't get to be with the group in the work that you are doing? Okay. Um, there is stuff in the workbook for astrology. I'm not going to read that. Um, you can read it. So I am going to scooch forward to, oh, we got that. We got that. Tara Hubbers, uh, ritual forms. So, um, I always try to teach these classes a week or so ahead of when the actual Sabbath is held. Uh, so that you have time to prepare for it. Number one most common and traditional way of celebrating fall equinox, which is Thanksgiving, Mabin, second harvest, whatever you call it, is feasting. Feasting, feasting, feasting. Sharing your bounty in whatever way makes sense for you. This doesn't mean that you need to go break the bank. This means look around at what you already have accumulated and share in that. Um, potlucks, they are about as magical as you can possibly get at this time of year. Yes, also COVID, so be smart about it. Um, this, uh, even up here in Seattle, the weather is still relatively nice at this time of day, night. Um, and so it's still possible to have outdoor stuff going on or indoor outdoor stuff going on, all of that stuff. Um, Making wine, absolutely, with all of the fruit that we have potentially been harvesting or that is being harvested uh, at this time of year. Offerings to trees, which are many of which are either going to be starting their shutdown and hibernation process, or they are going to be the conifers and the evergreens that protect us through winter. Divination, as we talked about previously, shadow work, obviously kind of a big deal at this time of year. Purification of self and home. So we're continuing that Virgo work, remembering and honoring ancestors. And a great way of doing that is cleaning up graves. It doesn't even have to be anybody that you know. You could just show up to your local cemetery, which again is also hearkening back to our Eleusis Mysteries work. Um, lighting lamps, walking in nature is something I will recommend for every single Sabbath under the sun. Uh, it's one of the most divine uh, ways of honoring a, a, a holiday or a Sabbath or a festival, in my opinion, is literally go out into the world, smell it, touch it, get on it, um, hang out with it, witness the shifting of nature. Um, meditation and solitude, after all of this work, taking a moment by yourself and reflecting and sort of getting grounded and centered for where we are headed. Um, atonement self-care and collecting seeds. Um, and atonement is an interesting word, but uh, it ultimately sits in this idea. Um, again, we are about to head into the darkness here, those of us in the Northern hemisphere, and we are about to head into the hard part of the year. Um, are, do you need to have a conversation with someone? Do you need to say, I'm sorry? Do you need to say, I forgive you? Um, is there a way that you can make amends with folks that deserve it and maybe even some folks that don't deserve it to make that passage through the dark half of the year a little bit easier for everybody, um, for you and for them, right? This is, you know, any place where we have beef with another person or we have guilt around our dealings with another person, that's an energetic drain. 
And that's something that's going to keep coming up as uh, sadness and frustration and weirdness for you in the midst of trying to deal with all this other stuff in this psychic economy. Nobody has time. Um, so in any way, um, you know, if you feel like you need to have a conversation with somebody to explain yourself, to apologize, to make amends, to just try to smooth things over. It doesn't mean that we're all going to be best friends afterwards, but at the very least, we can put that thing to bed. We can leave that thing in peace. We've agreed to disagree or whatever, however that situation turns out. But atonement as a holy act or a ritual act at this time of year can be exceptionally powerful in ways that are hard to put into words. Uh, and I'll just say that. Um, but also taking up a cause that is important to your community. That's work that we can do at any time of year. Um, but this is also about coming back to community and coming back and checking in with the people that are around you and what do we need to make it through this stuff. So mutual aid, kind of a big deal, um, that stuff. Um, other magical things that we can do at this time of year, like actual spell crafting that we that we can do within the midst of our uh, Mabin festivities, making witch bottles um, or little pouches or calling on spirits or allies or ancestors in the name of protection. Again, we have this harvest festival and we are harvesting the results of our year's work so we want to lay some protection over that stuff, right? If we're thinking, you know, if you're a farmer, cool, but I'm expecting the majority of the people that are watching this are not out in the fields pulling in thousands of pounds of grain and vegetables right now. Although I know some of you have some pea patch gardens. Yay, thank you. Um, <laughs> but calling in some protection for those resources, those stores, right? Um, have you canned or jarred anything? Are you fermenting anything right now from stuff that grew during summer? It was a great time to put a little protection spell over that stuff to make sure that the right uh, funguses are in there and the wrong funguses are not in there. Um, but also because, as I said, you know, as we see in our holy days, we are about to step into this breaking down of the natural order, right? And, um, and so asking for some protection as these systems that we've been able to rely on disintegrate or hibernate. Um, and, you know, again, looking around at society, <laughs> right? Some systems are failing us and some systems are breaking down. Some systems are saying, I have to stop. I have labored too long. I need rest. I need to pause. And our our systems are built on these systems running 24 hours, seven days a week, which turns out is untenable. And that natural and healthy pause that those systems need is going to cause disruption and turmoil and instability in our lives, even if it's ultimately toward a good end. So calling in some protection, calling in some stability, really potent magical work that we can do at this time of year acknowledging our prosperity and calling in more prosperity at this time of year is really potent work to do. And we can do that with candle magic. We can do that through blessing our gardens, blessing our house plants, literally blessing your pantry or your cupboards, uh, blessing your fridge, uh, where you store your foods, blessing your shopping bags, like literally <laughs> why not? Right. Um, weather magic in the form of protection, um, again, asking the storms and the shifting weather as summer leaves and, and fall rolls through and winter ultimately is being ushered in, asking for kindness, you know, or just, you know, do what you need to do, but please don't whoop my ass, great storms. Um, and offerings to the natural world as a means of saying thank you to the natural world, offerings to plants, offerings to animals, offerings to insects, um, as a means of saying thank you for everything that you have provided for us, whether that was your literal body um, for those of us who eat meat, um, whether that was your literal body for those of us who eat fruits and vegetables and grains, um, or perhaps we are thanking animals and birds and insects that are migratory that help pollinate, that help carry seeds from place to place. All of those beings and all of those cycles have been doing a lot of work for us. So we wanna say thank you to all of them. Um, we can also use uh, the migratory patterns of animals and insects for divination. This is called augury uh, and it is an exceptionally old form of divination. 
but literally witnessing um, uh, the patterns that they make as they move through the natural world and divining uh, information from those symbols and shapes. Super, super potent at this time of year. Um, what else? Oh, just some cute stuff. I totally left out looking at um, all of our culture, like what a, a bunch of the stuff that pagans are doing at this time of year. Um, so briefly, corn dollies. Um, <laughs> hope everybody can see that. I think you can. Um, corn dollies, big deal. Um, they come in small, medium, and large. They can be very, very simple. They can be very complex and fancy. They can be life-size or bigger than life-size. Um, and they don't even have to be humanoid. They can simply be something traditional that is braiding or knotting. And again, it can be something really fancy or really simple. Here are some more description or some more uh, examples of that stuff. And um, corn dollies are something that a lot of pagans will work with throughout this whole half of the year from now to in bulk season. These are often uh, grains that are initially collected during uh, lunasod season and kept woven for decoration or uh, turned into actual dollies, the kern baby, um, uh, the wheat mother, the wheat bride. And these are sometimes burned at Samhain, sometimes burned at Yule, sometimes kept all the way through to in bulk season. Again, speaking back to that idea that we see in the Eleusis Mysteries, of carrying the energy through from the end of one growth cycle into the beginning of the next growth cycle. And then these corn dollies that are kept all the way through in bulk season, when that first furrow is dug in the ground in February, this is placed in it. She or they are placed in that furrow. And so it is literally taking grains or pieces from the old harvest and that energetic cycle and bringing it through to the new energetic cycle. The seeds that are collected at this time of year as well, even if they're not literally going to be grown, will be thrown into that first furrow in the ground, carrying the energy through from the old cycle to the new cycle. They can get really, really fancy and really beautiful. I love that one. That one's really cool to me. And here's a whole collection of all different styles and, and types that people use. Um, so last but not least, because I know it's 8 p.m. Here's me going over. Welcome. From Doreen Valiente, a prayer. Farewell, O sun, ever returning light, the hidden God, whoever yet remains, now departs to the land of youth, Tirnanog, through the gates of death to dwell enthroned, the judge of gods and folks, the horned leader of the hosts of air. Yet as he stands unseen without the circle, so dwelleth he within the secret seed the seed of new reaped grain, the seed of flesh. Hidden in earth, the marvelous seed of the stars. In him is life, and life is the light of the people. That which was never born never dies. Therefore, the wise ones weep not, but rejoice. And here are some meditations for you. And you can use this in your ritual, or if you would like to use these as just private meditation moments throughout the season or journal entries or what have you. The spiral turns inward. In the name of the elder, see a vision of result and outcome. What is that vision? Passion and fear run deep. How do we find balance between the light and the dark? And last, and especially I recommend doing this if you go for a walk as a sacred act, consider this. You are earth, air, fire, and water. 
See yourself as a balanced being and write a letter to yourself from that place. And these meditations are inspired by Galen Jalot's Book of Hours, Prayers to the Goddess, one of the coolest books that I own. She also does one called Prayers to the God, which I haven't been able to find. I should have bought it when I saw it. Um, but it's literally like a, like a, 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 I always call it the wrong name, but it's not Psalms. It's a, it's literally like a, a, one of the common book of prayers that Catholics work with, where there's prayers for morning, noon, and night. There's prayers for every day of the week. There's prayers for the full moon and the new moon and and on and on. And it, it's just a really cool resource. Um, and all of our food and drink and minerals and stuff like that, that's all in the workbook. I'll flash these really quick for you guys, for those of you who aren't patrons and, or have um, uh, access to the thing. Um, cornucopia scales, the setting sun, a sheaf of grain, a spiral, grapes and wine. These are all appropriate items to have on your uh, Mabin or fall equinox altars. These are all fantastic fruits and veg and drinks to work with. Um, but in particular, as I always say, whatever the heck is in season, wherever you are, is going to be the most potent food and drink that you can possibly work with as well. Anything that you have grown or canned or jarred or fermented yourself, always going to be the most potent stuff you could possibly work with, even if it's not on this list or on any list. Mineral helpers that we can work with. And in particular, I feel like uh, kyanite, is really helpful here. Um, all of our opals, all of our tourmalines, those are uh, aligning us, chrysoprase as well, that's all aligning us with Libra energy. Um, plant helpers, all of our vines, ferns, passion flower, dried leaves, dried flowers, and seed pods from all of your local and indigenous uh, plants and trees. Don't set your house on fire by putting a bunch of dried stuff on there and lighting a bunch of candles. Don't sue me. Be, be smart witches, please. Animal helpers that we might work with, swan, geese, duck, dogs, deers, antelopes, snakes. Incenses, myrrh, cypress, eucalyptus, rose, violet, honeysuckle, all of that good stuff. And that, my friends, is fall equinox. Um, I hope that uh, the balance comes for you. <laughs> I hope that you have a moment um, at some point here in the next you know, few weeks <laughs> um, to stand with a foot in the light and a foot in the darkness and to witness those multitudes within yourself, to witness the variety of your life, the shifting of responsibility, uh, the shifting of power, uh, the shifting of shapes and the way that you transform from one portion of the year to the next. Um, we all have multitudes within us, and I think it's really powerful and potent that we um, refuse the message from capitalist society that says you are this one thing and it's missing all these parts and you can buy it over here uh, because we have all of that stuff within us already. Um, and if we don't have it, our neighbor probably has it and we can work with them to get close to it, right? <laughs> um, so I think that's it. I think that's our class. Um, and uh, don't be afraid or be afraid and do it anyways, right? Um, but uh, I really encourage you in this year, I know that we have had a hard ass two and a half years on earth, um, but I really encourage you this year to sit with the things that are not right in the world and what small local steps can you take to undo even one knot in the tapestry of humanity and make things a little more right? This is not work that any one person is going to do all by themselves. No single one of us is going to save the world. So just let that pressure go. It's not going to be you. It's not me. It's not any one of us. It's us collectively in the circle. No one is sitting in the front row and no one is on stage under the spotlight anymore. This is happening to us. And so we all have agency in this. Um, and as we move out of the light and into the darkness, new faces are going to reveal themselves. New forms of this work are going to reveal themselves. But this biological system that we are in uh, with each other and this planet and this particular solar system that we happen to be born in, um, is giving us this really incredible opportunity 
to feel the shift and take up the work and continue to be co-creators in this reality. So glad you have you on the team. <laughs> Let's get some shit done, witches. <laughs> All right, my friends, that is it. Um, I'm going to do this now. Boom. Thank you to everybody who uh, joined and um, blessed be.